The series we have just completed, Fully Removing the Oppression, has been, a one, has been one about those things that came upon God's church or have come upon God's church at the end time and what we experienced that led up to the apostasy, going through some of those things in Isaiah. And the, and the importance of all this is to understand how Isaiah begins, to understand that Isaiah is focusing upon what he's prophesying is about the end time, specifically about the church. It isn't about the world. There are types of things in the world that we can see taking place because it's on a physical plane if we look at it physically, but that's not what it's all about. And it was about those things that led up to the apostasy it's about those things in chapter 3 that we have already read that have not been seen before, that have been just buried, basically, until God reveals it, about children will be your oppressors and women will rule over you, and that being taken always in a negative way in the past. And it's not a negative thing, totally mistranslated, and it's a very positive thing when we understand it. So we've gone through that and discussed some of those things to me that are very exciting because it just brings up more and more as we continue through this series as well. The apostasy, what happened then, what happens afterwards, is exceedingly important to God, what he's doing with his church in completing a structure and completing the temple at least the first phase of it, if you will, in the first resurrection of the 144,000, and those who are going to live on into the millennium. So again, incredible thing to realize that it records that God would establish a small group, a remnant, that which was left over, and to grasp what all that means. Like in the, I still don't feel like cucumbers is the right thing, but uh, <laughs> in the field of cucumbers, or if I could remember that word now, that reggae song, cucumba or something, I don't know. Anyway, uh, whatever it is that they say, uh, but uh, also in a field of, uh, vine uh, in a vineyard, basically, and showing that this is all that's left. It's, it's gone. And all you see is what's remaining out here. And then to understand that some of the words associated with that have to do with the importance of being watchful, of being alert, that God has left that that's going to be watchful, that's going to be alert, that's going to be on guard with what remains, and there's not much there. Anyway, so we're living through all this right now because God's doing that through this Feast of Tabernacles, revealing these things, helping us to understand more what His desire is in making things right, in removing what we have referred to in times past as the curse, and after 6,000 years to understand that Finally, the world's going to begin to be set right, beginning in families. That's where it all begins. It begins in the structure of the home, in the family. And if that isn't right, and if people don't see each other right, and if men and women, husbands and wives don't see each other right, you're going to wander away farther and farther in the sense of the way it should be and become weighted down in something that really works to, to tear away. That's a horrible thing instead of building up and becoming stronger. So in addition, in addition to establishing greater truth more than any other time within his church, that he would give charge to his church to begin again setting things right, learning to establish his judgment, which is something we've had in a lot of sermons in the last couple of years, the, and those things in those scriptures yesterday, the importance of establishing justice, judgment, right judgment, right thinking. It's about thinking. It's about how we perceive things and how to deal with things and, and not to base them on our opinions and the way I see it, the way I think about it. Even within the church, so often people, it's, it's the way I see it, the way I think it should be, or the way I think someone else should be doing something. And that's the wrong way to judge. It doesn't matter what you think about it, what I think about it, apart from God, it's what God says and how we're to address it and deal with it. And so we strive to receive that from God and live that. That's why I love the things that Christ said. <laughs> if I judge, my judgment is just. He didn't judge, as he said, by his own will, by his own purpose. He judged according to God's judgment, and that's why it was righteous judgment. Incredible. So all this began in the church with two in time truths. And 
The last addition to fully complete this is by or through the example set within the church itself that women be given rule. That's what God charges there in Isaiah 3, that they are to have it within the church. More on the level or a plane, if you will, then, that men have held for over 2,000 years, which the greatest hurdle, the greatest stride forward in, then is to speak within the church, to teach, to preach God's way of life. And it isn't a matter of speculating who is going to be next or what's going to take place. To ask other people, are you next? Are you going to do it? Because this is a matter of what God is doing and how God is doing it. And we wait on God to do whatever God has established. And basically that will come through me. And so again here, so some things aren't wise to do. They're not good to do. They're not healthy to do spiritually. We're making a leap forward. We're moving forward. And we need to wait and see how God works with that. So that may be the only sermon in this age. I don't know yet. Depends on how much time we have. If we have more time, probably ought to start preparing another one. <laughs> There's a way that God works and a process whereby God works, and I have to wait on God. That's why in the beginning when we started addressing these truths, I basically made the statement that I felt that this would not take place until the millennium if it were to take place. I, I just didn't feel, didn't believe at that point in time because God wasn't giving it at that time. <laughs> That's why. That it was to start in this age before he, Christ returns. What a beautiful thing that he's let us start that process. So we're now going to continue focusing, on, focusing upon some of those things given in the book of Isaiah surrounding the very context that concerns the end time here again, continuing on with some of those things. And that in this sermon that's entitled, The Church, Israel, and God's Kingdom. Because these things in Isaiah are focusing upon a great transition. <laughs> the transition is from the age of mankind's self-rule to God's rule. It's what Isaiah is largely about, the focus. And that involves in a very great way, because we're in it, we're in God's church, we're the ones being worked with at the end of the age, not all the others who were 6,000 years before this, but now, because this is when it's happening is now, and we have the part in it. <laughs> what an incredible opportunity to be a part of something so great, so incredibly great where more insight, more knowledge, more understanding of God and God's plan and His Son and all the other things that He's given to us that we are so very wealthy and rich in spiritually and not to do what Laodicea did and let it go up here or take it for granted or begin to be lukewarm and think that we have enough or whatever. It's a matter of building up on what we have and making it strong and guarding it and protecting it, fighting for it, not letting it slip through our fingers. What we've experienced as the result of the first sermon given by a woman who opened the Feast of Tabernacles and what God has now revealed concerning the incredible significance of this is truly far greater than what we can really grasp at this time. I've been working on this for a few months, focusing upon some of these things. And the farther along we go, the more I'm grasping, the more I'm seeing, and, the more I'm, and I've been working on this. So I know that you can't take it in all at once. It's a spiritual matter. It's a matter of building. It's a matter of growing. And it'll become more exciting to you as time goes on. And you'll be able to see things more clearly as time goes on. You'll understand things more fully as time goes on. It takes time. And so what an incredible thing to even grasp that. We can't see it all. And even once you begin seeing a lot more, you still won't grasp it all. There's more to come when Christ returns. So again, although we have been given so much by God, the level of importance, 
the level of the astounding significance once again, and the level of what we have experienced is exceedingly phenomenal, just to be a part of it. Let's turn over to Revelation 17. We have actually been experiencing, one, again, one of the greatest moments of all human history right now. Again, you're not going to fully understand that or appreciate that for a while, even after you hear all the sermons at this feast, but you'll grow in it more. We are to begin that process now. But I'm reminded of what a moment in time was for Herbert Armstrong that's similar to this. Here in Revelation 17, when he was able to see a section of scripture, a, a, I'm sorry, a section of scripture that was revealed to him at the very moment in time that it was for, that it was given. Verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. Now, when things are stated like this, it, it's not just a matter of reading this through as a story. We need to grasp what this is about. What mind has wisdom? None of us have wisdom of and by ourselves. The wisdom of mankind sucks. It's from God. That's why I love the book of Proverbs when it talks about wisdom, because it's the same as when it talks about the word of God. It's the mind and the being of God, and it is full wisdom. His word, his ways, comes from the great God of the universe. The source is God. So what mind can have wisdom? The one that God gives it to, because we don't have it of ourselves. You can't figure these things out by yourself, like I experienced so often in Worldwide, where people thought they had experienced something, had some knowledge of something, and felt like others needed to see it, needed to know about it, because they discovered this through their strong concordance and their great studying that they did every day in their Bible. I think, you're nutty to fruitcake. It has to come from God. God just reveals what is true. You're not going to figure it out on your own, and it's not even going to come through you. It's going to come from God's apostle, Herbert Armstrong at that time. That's simple to understand. And yet so many people went off bonkers sometimes on ideas and beliefs. We deal with a lot of this in the church. People had different ideas and beliefs, and they'd come along, and they'd start talking to their friends, and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd have these little Bible studies of their own. Dumb, dumb mistake. We still had it in PKG in recent time when people get together and have their own private Bible study. That's against God's way of life. That's against everything the church teaches. That's sin. It's sin to do so, to have your own private Bible studies where you're researching the Bible and discussing things among yourselves if anybody were to do that. And those who were doing that in that little group there in Cincinnati as a whole... The majority of them are gone, some being ministers. Can, can we learn from our past? Because we're supposed to. That's the important thing. We're to learn from our past, the mistakes that were made in our past. That's why we go through history, and that's why I talk about things and repeat things sometimes. I was thinking about that this morning. I thought, well, hopefully it's not sounding to some like the two trees, and they're tired of hearing it. When I go back and repeat something of our past and some experience that was there, because those are the lessons, those are the experiences that we're to drink in from. By the experience, we're to grow in wisdom, God's mind. He works with us in that way. Anyway, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Now, up to this moment in time when this was revealed, if anyone was reading this and they tried to figure it out, let's see, seven heads or seven mountains. Hmm. Could that be the area around Rome, the seven? Or Cincinnati, anyway. <laughs> it doesn't do any good until God gives it. You can speculate and think about it all you want, but until God gives it, you don't know. Even if you had it right. Still don't know until God gets it, if you understand that. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Sits. <laughs> they are seven kings. Five are fallen, 
and one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. So this is at a period of time where God was working through Herbert Armstrong to reveal things prophetically about the end time, to understand things that would happen in the world in the end time, and what some of the things meant when you talk about the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had a vision or a dream of and was revealed then through Daniel. And on and on it goes, some of the things in Revelation. And this was a moment in time for Herbert Armstrong when he knew what this meant. Because God was working with him in his mind, in the spirit of his mind, communicating to him, helping him to unravel, to see certain things, revealing it to him as he did to Daniel and different ones through times past, what things meant. But he went through a different kind of process, a unique process. And so he understood. Five have fallen. And one is in World War II. And one is yet to come. One more. That's why he started preaching almost immediately after this, especially when Life magazine came out and believed that there was this guy with a funny mass mustache that wasn't dead yet. Life magazine in the United States came out with the articles. There was still speculation. They really haven't killed him. Where is the proof? How do you know he's dead? And so it's like, there's evidence now that some are moving, going to be moving in different areas. And so anyway, uh, when he began preaching after this point in time and knowing what this was all about and talking about Germany's going to rise again, you know what that would sound like to the world after World War II when they had been decimated at the end, toward the end, that they're going to rise again? Still a war going on, but they hadn't quite come to that point in time, but they were being boxed back in and Cities were being bombed like mad by the Allies. How crazy that would sound to people. He's, he's going to rise again. Germany's going to rise again. <laughs> I wonder what he's smoking. Well, back then they weren't smoking that stuff. Anyway, that I know of. So what an experience. When I read this in times past, I thought, that is awesome that he had the ability, the opportunity to experience something like this when something's being revealed and then he's living through it and it's like an aha moment. <laughs> this is it. From God, the mind that has wisdom, the blessing of being blessed with wisdom. And we're being blessed more than that by far many times over just because of where we are and what God's working out and all the scriptures and things in scripture about the end time and about the church and the apostasy that we haven't grasped and understood to its full extent. And God preparing for those things and how he would work through a church, a remnant, a small group at the end, that little thing that was left in the middle of all the cucumbers. Anyway. So it's hard for us to grasp how great this is. When you experience something like that, sometimes we're just living normal lives and going to another Feast of Tabernacles. And yes, it's exciting, but to really grasp how great this really is, it's tough to do. We need God's help. That's why we have to pray to God, help me to feel this, to see this, to know this through your spirit, to be convicted of it through your spirit. Not just to be excited about something like this, but to know it, to see it, to understand it, and what's given in Scripture. That it come alive more and more. So, again, this was an awesome experience. Ours is vastly greater, truth number 51, even as this all began. God is restoring knowledge concerning the rightful place of women in the family. This involves the start of the greater removal of the curse laid upon women from the beginning, which was the result of sin. So we've lived through that. Some had difficulty with that. Some didn't grasp that. Some didn't grasp it to the degree they needed to to make changes in their life, to repent of the wrong thinking, the wrong judgments that were being made toward women. 
And so these things continued on as God continued to give us more, more truth, more understanding. So we've taken a quantum leap forward in this becoming fulfilled in the world after 6,000 years and in becoming fulfilled after 2,000 years within the church itself. So we're going to continue right from where we left off yesterday in part two, fully removing the oppression, but I want to back up just a tad because I wasn't able to cover the last part as clearly as well as I wanted to because of this great big red light right in front of me that just, anyway. So, the verses as they are, a reminder, quickly. Isaiah 3.12, my people take away the oppression of women and give or have them rule. Not just to be in the ministry, but this kind of rule in that respect has more to do with the teaching and the giving of instruction and direction to God's people. That's the kind of rule being spoken of here. My people who are to be moving forward, wander or err, and are being swallowed up in the way of their path. Incredible, as we will come to understand more deeply in time, that this is the very reason that things broke down even more so within the church and families, because families were in the ministry, and the ministry made these errors, and it wasn't good. It was going to break down just because it was the wrong structure. So jumping on down to another verse here. Isaiah 1, verse 16. Again, to understanding what the beginning of Isaiah is about, because to understand the rest of Isaiah, we need to know where this, these things are going. So things were talk, spoken of concerning what would happen. My people are rebellious. They rebel against me. And understanding this is about the church and the greatest rebellion of all time. Far, far greater if we grasp it then again of what Lucifer did. That was heinous and hideous and a third of the angelic realm. But in the creation of Elohim, it was far more heinous because of what took place, truly. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. So it's about repentance so that anyone that was going to be a part of in the midst of those cucumbers, in the midst of that vineyard, this is what had to take place. Make yourselves clean. It's about repentance, and we're still doing that. God is still revealing things where we are to make ourselves clean. And that means to repent of some of the prejudicial attitudes and thinking toward other people and primarily women. And if respect and honor to the position of an ordination is not shown, you don't know what you're doing toward God and toward Joshua. And this has happened way too much in God's church since this process began of women being ordained. Happened here recently again. Just as soon as a woman was ordained, some problems pricked up. Had to deal with it, and they've repented fully, and I'm very thankful of that for those who are involved. But that's too much of a pattern sometimes, and we think we're understanding something, and we think we've received a truth, and yet we haven't repented and changed because it's so deeply embedded up here. That's where it is. It's in the mind, and the mind has to be transformed and changed. Can't just go through the motions and practice it here or there a little bit out of because you're going to be looked down upon or something's going to be said. No, it's because you're convicted by God's spirit of the right way to think. And you're learning to love women on a greater plane in a right way than before when you couldn't because you didn't understand. So you think this attitude in the world still doesn't exist out here and it's in us as well within the church and some to different varying degrees and the like? It's a battle. You have to conquer it and overcome it. It has to be changed. This is where it begins in a very big way. So that's why God says what we have to do here. It's a matter of, again, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil 
of your doings from before my eyes, God says. He doesn't want this, especially now that he's revealed it. It's like, make it right. <laughs> make things right. Work at it. Change your attitude. Change the way you think. Because the way you've thought all your life hasn't been right. What an incredible thing to understand. And then women about themselves sometimes because of that process, because that's the way they've lived all their lives. Their minds aren't right either in many cases. Have to change the way you think in that regard. To speak up, to make a comment when it's necessary. This isn't right. That isn't right before God. Anyway, cease to do evil because these things, the curse, the sin, the attitude of mind of unrighteous judgment toward others, so the same thing we see easily then in between races that's out there in the world, both sides, sometimes it's just like, well, it's just one side that has the prejudice. Oh, no, 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 no. It's a two-way street. Because after you've been treated a certain way for a long time, you have prejudice then as well because you've had this experience so often and then you turn against others and are prejudiced in your thinking. And that exists in God's church. So both sides have to get clean. Does that make sense? Both sides have to clean up their minds and repent of all prejudice. There shouldn't be any looking down the nose at anyone else, being smug or thinking you're better than someone else. What a hideous thing that we should do that. It's evil because of sin. So that's what God is telling us. Get rid of the evil before my eyes. And that's what God's doing in the church, and I love it. Because living through Philadelphia, living through Laodicea, living through the apostasy, so many things, there are things that had to be got. It had been so much better if they never were around, but we, did, we weren't there. We we're there now where God is cleansing his church he is purifying and strengthening us. He's working at sealing a certain group as well, finishing that process. And we're going to know when that's finished. And then others preparing them to live on into a new age, being worked with. That's why I know that there are certain things that cannot continue to exist in some people's lives. And to be on the other side of all this, if God had the power to see to it that thousands upon thousands and tens of thousands died in the wilderness and they weren't going to be able to, allowed to go into the promised land. Think he can do that with a few in his church that aren't going to go into that on a spiritual plane to be around Christ and 144,000 in the millennium and the start of it? It's a given. That's why God has given to me in a very powerful way to tell everyone we change, we grow, we repent, or we will not be there. And some who have played games and continue to play games out there, some who are playing games, listening to me out there when they hear this, some of it's been going on for years in your life and you're not changing. You become shrewd and sharp and keen and skillful in playing your games to where you seem righteous. You sound almost righteous when you tell your story about why you're doing certain things or not doing certain things. And you become such a professional at it and you deceive yourself and you're deceiving others. Well, you're not deceiving me because of God's spirit and you're not deceiving everyone. So your time is very short in God's church. <laughs> This stuff just goes on and on and on. That's why I've made comment. It's going to continue right up to the end. And you know what happens at the end? Toward, closer to the end, God will take care of it. It'll be by death. God will take care of it. If it that doesn't happen within the church, of cleansing the church, of becoming disfellowshipped in that respect, and making it clear to everyone they're not a part, they weren't a part, haven't been a part for years, they're playing games. So... Wow, I mean, I'll get through this sermon. Anyway, so we've got to respond. We've got to fight. We've got to change as God gives us truth. You know, it's our choice. Anyway. <sighs> yeah, I lost my place. Okay. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. 
Beautiful. You have to learn how to do that. Good comes from God. Doesn't come from you. Doesn't come from us. Doesn't come from me. It can come through us because of yielding to God and our minds are changing and we're in agreement and unity with God. Then that good, which is of God, we're able to experience and have in our life. That's what we want because we want to be at one with God and look forward to the time that's going to be eternal or everlasting, I should say, because it's not eternal because that's going back. Anyway, seek justice. Seek it. That takes work. You can't just l read these scriptures and, oh, that, that's, that's interesting. You know, you've got, you've got to put it to practice. You've got to put it to work. You've got to think about it and pray about it to God. Maybe during the feast, but especially after the feast, work on it. To seek justice, to seek to hear the sermons that have been given in the past two to three years now, especially in the last two years, about judgment. I've, I've given a ton of them. Because that's what God wanted to have to lead up to this time, to even drive the point home even more so, that we've got to judge righteous judgment. We've got to judge because it's based on the mind and being and word of God. Straighten out the way. I love that because what we've been reading about. Straighten out the way, it says, of the restless or the weary, as it really is, in that respect, who are being oppressed. It has to do with oppression as well. But I, I think of that. You think it's... It hasn't been easy for women who don't understand why they have to fight so hard for equal pay on a job and that men automatically give more or they're given the promotions more readily. I mean, it happens. Sick, 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 because of the kind of prejudice that still exists all over the world. And sadly, sometimes it's, well, because we live in the world, it's in us because God called us out of the world. And until we see it and understand it, and I go back to this thing of women being ordained in the church and the respect that they're not shown. Aggravates the tar out of me. There are times we should keep our mouths shut and listen and learn from God's ministry. Anyway. And then finally, Isaiah 1.18. I'm going to read it as it's supposed to be. Not, I'm not going to go through and explain all this and some of these things. Like it says, come now and let us reason together. None of that's in the Hebrew. It says, go. And the word here, let us reason together, is to prove. Go. Prove. How often have we heard that? Prove me. Prove my way. How do you do that? We, we live it. We start practicing it. That's how we learn it. We start putting it to work in our life and making changes and repenting to prove God's ways. Go prove me. Prove my ways is what God is saying here, says the eternal. Although your sins are like scarlet, they shall become white as snow. So leading up to the apostasy, seeing the apostasy and then the need to repent and the things that God was going to give in the church, this is the process. God is cleansing his church. Although they are red like crimson, they should be like wool. If, always oh, that big if, if you're willing and obedient. To be willing means you've got to do something just to think about it and think it's a good thing and then go off and do the same old things isn't, isn't it. We have to be willing to do God's will, to practice it, to live it, to prove it. That, that, to prove it means you have to put it to work. If you are willing and obedient, Obedient to the truths God gives to his church. Obedient to every truth. That's how we're to live our life. That, that, that's the mind and being of God. He wants us to see himself. He wants us to see him, I should say. And to be in unity with him. To say, that's right. That's the right way. Even though I don't maybe fully understand it. And so all the things I've just mentioned, the prejudices, whether they be in race or whether they be toward gender, they, they need to come to a screeching halt in your life, in our lives, because they're still in God's church on both sides when you talk about race even. Because these things are closely related in the sense of prejudice and judgments and things that happen through time. But the greater one and the most important one, if we learn that one and we grow in that one, we'll begin to more fully even understand the other. If you're willing and obedient, then you shall eat the good of the land. 
This isn't a physical thing, that we're going to have plenty of food on our table or whatever. <laughs> How many of us are suffering in that regard? You know, it's, it's about that which is spiritual that God wants to give to us. But if you refuse and rebel, which some still are out there. I think of one who's not even communicating with the church, been playing games out there for I don't know how long, still thinks they're a part of the church, and they won't communicate with the ministry. Have to find, I don't even know where they are right now. That's nuts. And that stops immediately after the feast. They're going to be disfellowshipped. Not going to have, there's no more time for patience with shit stupidity and arrogance and I just want to call it dumbness. I'm sorry, but I get worked up about these things. And indeed, we should be worked up. Helps to bring about repentance, if we'll respond in that way. <sighs> Mind-boggling. These kind of things can happen. Still, we think we're part of God's church and doing dumb things. Not connected, not even in fellowship, not trying to be. Not even in contact with the ministry. I wonder... After all these three years, or whatever it's been now, plus, uh, how many times have you, have you, have you ever been sick? You, you're probably a very healthy person then. Because if you've been sick, you were supposed to contact the ministry and get, a, get an anointing cloth. That's what God commands you. We still have some in the church that won't do that. I, I don't mean, <laughs> I need to get anointed, you know. Uh, or, oh, it's hard for me to get out of bed. <laughs> well, you know, if it keeps you from going to work or having or being able, you know, so we have to we learn balance in that as well. When to call upon God and obey God when He says to get anointed. It means you're sick and you can't work. You can't go out and do the things you might normally do in your home or whatever, or go to work, whatever. Then get anointed. And, and there's still people who won't get anointed. I know because the ministers let me know who they've anointed. And some are pretty close, and I know that too. Anyway. <sighs> it just makes me want to hit myself upside of the head, and when I do, then I hurt. Anyway. Man, oh man. I'm not going to get through this. Anyway. Let's go on. <laughs> Set the stage. <laughs> we're caught up. Now we're moving forward in this sermon. Fully removing the oppression part. No, that's what I just gave. Yeah, let me get rid of some papers here. I'm going to have so many papers I'll be giving you yesterday's sermon if I'm not careful here. <laughs> oh, I about threw away today's. <laughs> I'm just going to go through this quickly to make sure I have this in order now after I did that one. Whew, yeah, that one there too. Okay. I think we can move forward. Now, this is a coffee cup. It is the only exception. It is tea, hot tea for my throat. So, I'm sorry. <clears throat> now, I've just got to find where I left off there. Okay. Let's begin by going back to Isaiah now. Because we're continuing on with this flow, with this focus that we're going to have here. Isaiah 1, verse 21. Going to look at how this continues to unfold. How the faithful city has become a harlot. Pretty strong words. So in times past, it's been very easy to look at Jerusalem and look at the madness the hatreds that exist there, the fighting that exists there, and the fighting over various things just within the old city itself before you even get out in the city. And to understand there's nothing holy there, it's not the holy city. And to understand what's really being said here, how the faithful city has become a harlot. Now we talked about Israel yesterday. We talked about Judah. And then we talked about Jerusalem. And so much of that is the seat of government. That's, that's where the apostasy came from, first and foremost, through them, through that process, because it goes down through the church, is taught, and then people become weaker and are led away from the truth, become stagnant. And this is what God says. 
spiritual, spiritual adultery. Other things that they begin to teach, other things that they begin to do that move people away from, and it goes on. Anyway, it was full of justice. You know, within Philadelphia, when Herbert Armstrong was at the helm and his greatest of health, even toward the end, though it was because of the sickness he had there for that time, heart attack and the like through the mid to later 70s there, and then came back with strength and power. During that time, many had inserted themselves and fighting for a position and the like. But when he came back, he came back strong to set things right. And those who responded to that on a spiritual plane, those who were indeed not becoming stagnant, this is describing them. It was full of justice. And those who worked there at headquarters as well, who had that mindset to support him and back him, which sadly were becoming fewer and fewer, there was a time, but especially even before that, before they started doing these things. Righteousness lodged in it. It was there. I mean, we had a lot of bad things that were taking place that we didn't even know about, but overall, Philadelphia was an incredible era of God's church. We were exceedingly blessed during that time and really protected. So many of us in the church, we didn't know what was going on and some of the things within the ministry at different areas is well hidden, and God did that for our protection, for the church to continue on. In that case, ignorance was great. <laughs> Some things we, we don't know about in, in a situation like that, because of being at the state of our growth we were, good thing that God did that, otherwise it wouldn't have been here. But now murderers, murderers go so far to teach things, to do things on the side, to give counsel of things that are so off base that it begins to hurt people. And people begin to listen and go in a different direction than what they were given through God's apostle. Your silver has become dross. The truths, they were being watered down in the church by different wands. They didn't go and preach about the truths. They didn't preach about the truths like we heard in the first sermon of the first woman to get up and go through some of those. Some of those, as they were being gone through and various things spoken of, like being in camp and the various things that God was still giving to us as a body, molding and fashioning us. Um, I think that's where one set of tears came from. But anyway... <laughs> It meant a lot just to hear that to, because it moves and motivates us to realize what we've gone through, what we've experienced anyway. So your silver has become dross. That's sad when the truth begins to, to be tarnished and more value is being placed on the dross. And your wine mixed with water, things being watered down, it's a good expression. That's, that's what happened. Your princes, rebellious, oh, I think of different ones, working their way in, trying to work their way in, in different areas there at the very end. God's apostle getting sick again or ill and getting weaker toward the end. And before that even happens, certain ones trying to work their way in, certain ones being given favor, one by his father, that he should never have been a minister ever because of the example he set in church areas and what he did in the past, but oh no, he's brought in and begins to be given more and more power. And then he's got some buddies that they went to imperial school with, and three of them especially, little cohorts, you know, and all their little things that they were doing in the background, trying to break things down before Herbert Armstrong ever died. And then as soon as he died, they began to even work more on the father, you know, to guide and direct him. And he succumbed to that in time. It took two to three years, but he started to succumb to a lot of that and began to go along with a lot of that. And eventually we had an apostasy. Your prince is rebellious, <laughs> disgusting what they did, hideous what they did. And I believe some committed the unpardonable sin because of what they did. Their minds are so perverted and so gone and so sick. And compassion, our companions, <laughs> and companions of thieves, 
to steal, to rob. Did it for what they could get, and stealing and robbing and taking that which they shouldn't have done in God's own church in Jerusalem. Spiritual. Everyone loves bribes. Was it money that they were giving? No. But it was about what they could get out of it. There was akin to that. Favor, bribes, you'd, you'd, pressure. Others were being pressured to submit to some of these things because these had power to hire and fire. And so if you don't do a certain thing a certain way, and if you succumb to that and give in to that, rather than standing up and saying, well, I won't tell you what I would say right now. But anyway, everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. What, they can, that's what you can get out of it for the wrong reasons. Not because of conviction, not because it was from God. This is what we live through. Incredible. They do not defend the fatherless. On the contrary, they, they were creating them. If you understand what it is. Those being cut off from God by perverting the truth and so the hungry and those that were there and needing the things that they needed, these were taking from them and that's what was being created. Like, like the issues of Passover and how that was being tarnished and torn down. Nor does the cause of the widow, those forsaken, look down upon. And if anyone held up for the truth, in time, they were being weeded out. You know, we'd, we'd hear certain rumors, and, and I have to control myself. There were certain ones at headquarters who had job positions and so forth, evangelists and the like, who had various functions and jobs, um, and they weren't letting the ministry know what was happening out. They knew two years before everything came down on the, on the church, and they weren't letting us know. So we'd hear a rumor once in a while that they were doing something at headquarters. So if you made a call to headquarters to talk to Joe Jr. or whomever you might get, um, and I won't mention other ones, but anyway, uh, and you would ask a question, they knew by your question where you stood because of the way you ask it. So they knew what they had a spiel to give to you. And if it was something you were kind of leaning toward and wondering about, they would help you lean there a little bit more and feed you a little bit more. And you would have this close co contact then with them and, and you had this camaraderie and rewards. And anyway, it's amazing what we've gone through. Verse 24. Therefore, the Lord says, the eternal of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, alas, I will rid myself of my adversaries. Now, in times past, we wouldn't have thought that this is about the church. Any, we wouldn't have considered this as being about the church as a matter of context. But once God begins to show us this is about the church, this is about, this is about the greatest apostasy of all time. This is about some of the greatest manifestation of evil of all time. Because people with God's Holy Spirit, the impregnation of God's Spirit, were rebelling against God Almighty more and more and more from the top down. Alas, I will rid myself of my adversaries and execute judgment on my enemies. <laughs> Go against God, you're, we become an enemy. We have learned to classify that in a very strong and powerful way as being anti-Christ. Because we understand that in ways to a degree that has never been understood, what it means to be anti-Christ, against Christ. And if we're against Christ, we're against God. If we're against God's apostle and what's being given to the church, you're against Christ, you're against God. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your ten. I will restore your judges as at the first. And so... This is how far you've moved away from me, and I'm going to restore, even as it was at the first. You go back to the beginning of the church and what was established. I will restore your judges as at the first, and, your, and that's about PKG. And your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called 
the city of righteousness. So that's what, that's what God's been doing with the church. It's going to be within the ministry, a city of righteousness, and the church, Judah, is going to be a nation of righteousness because this is where it begins. This is how it works. The faithful city. So again, referring to Jerusalem and the things that are meant there, more about the ministry in that respect. Zion. Zion now. All. Zion shall be redeemed with justice. This is how it's going to be done because it comes to being in agreement with God and learning how to judge according to the way God wants us to judge, according to His will, not our will. That's why we've had some sermons that have hit pretty hard about this thing of our opinions and the way I see it, the way I think it should be. I, I don't like that. I'm in disagreement with that. I don't think it should be done that way. <laughs> Who cares what you think if it, it's against what we're doing? as a body. We're, we're to be one moving forward. That's what's important. That's just calling a spade a spade. It's in cards. Spade. Yeah. And those who returned or who turned back with righteousness. God gave a blessing and an opportunity for some to return, to turn back from the sliding and the slipping and the going asleep and those things that took place. Chapter 2. Then the account surrounding these events goes on to build upon other timing of end time events that will lead into the kingdom of God becoming established. And so, again, remembering the context of chapter 1, continuing, chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So, again, there's certain things that we can see on a physical plane in the world, but we're talking very much about the church as well. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Eternal's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. We understand what that means. This is what God's working toward when God's kingdom comes to this earth, when it's established on this earth, and 144,000 are in Elohim, and what will take place from then on? Because Isaiah is very much about getting to this point, have, having those things brought to pass that we're picturing here in this Feast of Tabernacles. And what preceded that was an apostasy. And so it goes back and forth here a little bit in what's being discussed, because this is where we're headed. This is our focus. This is what we want. And all nations shall flow into it. It's going to take time, the things that are going to take place and transpire. But as a whole, what an incredible thing to know such a giant adjustment in the beginning. Establishing one government over the earth. Establishing one church over all the earth. Incredible. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the eternal. God's government, God's ways, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we will walk in His paths. So that's going to be an incredible movement in the millennium. As a whole, we're going to be able to be there to experience that in ways that we can't grasp yet. But it'll be so incredible. Just being at the Feast of Tabernacles is such an incredible thing. The closeness, the fellowship the rejoicing before God that if, if we're not able to do that, anyway, it's just kind of automatic. It's just there. You can't help it. It's exciting. Well, what we're experiencing is so small, so, but it's a tight, but it's going to be so grand as we go forward. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the eternal from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. I think of that statue in front of the United Nations. That's this right here. Doing, going through this process. And you think, what a farce. They want it. They just don't know how. Man can't do it. Nations can't come together and agree. The whole system. You just look at it and think, 
It's impotent. It's worse than that. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I love that. I really love this because one of the things as I was growing up as a young person, I had this idea of being in the military, didn't want to just be in the military. I'd read a book about George Washington. I wanted to be a general. <laughs> When I was out there herding sheep, when I, for a, I guess about 9, 10, 11 in through there, that uh, walk out there along the road, tracks get down there, let them out to graze, and then put them back, and I'd read that, that particular book that I remember reading. Now, my wife is smiling back there because she knows I haven't read many books in my lifetime. <laughs> I prefer to wait until it's a movie. Anyway. <laughs> But it forms your mind, learning war, because this is about war. You want to be a general? You, you want to lead a military? Uh, and on and on it goes. So then you see advertisements, you see toys, you see all this that teaches the glamour of war. And it's so hideous. And then people go off to war and they come back and they're messed up. I wish I could remember how many minutes it is at suicides in the U.S. from people in the military who have come back from war and so forth, and it's, it's insane because, and they don't, don't receive the help they should have when they come back. You think, we make it so, sound so great, and then when they go, and they're like fodder after that. It's like, who cares? I think of the, um, the hospitals, what do they call those again? Um, VA. I could think of a word for that one there. Very awful. Anyway, uh, they've been a joke in times past as a whole. And oh, I'm sorry, but to me, the fact that people aren't going to be taught war, they're not going to have toys of war, they're not going to have games of war. Uh, anyway. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the eternal. You left your people, the house of Jacob, because they were filled with eastern ways, used enchantment like the Philistines. Kind of reference to what we see today in the practice and the speech of Protestantism. That's a tough thing if people have been immersed in that to come out of that and to speak and use things in a kind of a Protestant sounding way because it's easy to get into a habit talking about God and talking in a... I don't know how to describe it except just to call it a kind of a Protestant kind of speaking and talking. And, and you know, it makes me want to gag. Because what we are to live and talk is to be in spirit and in truth. Not a put on, not a show, because that becomes a show. It becomes about self. It's about, and, and we can't have that in our lives. And they applaud themselves through the youth of foreigners, again, those who have never known what's right and true. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there is no end of their storehouse. Their land is full of horses, and there is no end of their chariots. Can you imagine some people, when they are resurrected and they see the kinds of things that have come about to the end of this age, just in technology? You know, semis that can shoot down the highway, cars, and tons of them, or to see film or whatever it might be of some of these things. Okay, before you go out there, we're going to have the screen come down, and we're going to show you what it's like right now, or what it has been like up to the war that took place. Those are automobiles, thousands, and those going around those circles, they're not just going in circles forever, they're going someplace. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> But just to see certain things in the world and realize how they had to do things. Yes, say it. Microwave. <laughs> Oven. No, no, no wood. No dried up manure that you had to pick up and, and use for fire and cooking things on. Uh, you just, just push this button. It says on. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Mind boggling. You think, well, what did these people do? 
They didn't go out and work the land. <laughs> they didn't go out and spend any time hardly at all in preparing their food. They just go get it out of the freezer and slop it in. And what is this? Oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, the land is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands. It's the way we are as a people in this world. That which their own fingers have made, rather than worshiping God, this is what people look to, to save them, to help them, and what they're going to do with what they have. And, and if that isn't good enough, then let's, let's build these things that will get out there to the asteroids and to the moon and do some, and, and mine that stuff. We might strike it really rich, and if we can figure out how to get all this, anyway. Anyway, mankind bows down and they humble themselves. They humble themselves. Now, they humble themselves before what they have made. This is, what, this is what we do in that respect. And when it's not there, we go to pieces. <laughs> and this part here, therefore do not forgive them, is not even in the Scripture. And they humble themselves before what they have lifted up, is the verse. Verse 10. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust for the terror of the eternal and the glory of his majesty. So again here, there's a story flow we're going through, talking about, in essence, what took place. My people, you have rebelled. Look at what's taken place. We're about the apostasy. And now we're talking about what's taking place here at the very end. What has to take place within the world. The lofty looks of mankind shall be humbled. Can't work with people filled with pride. Can't have them be able to have a book. You know, when I was growing up, might as well just used it for toilet paper because we didn't have toilet paper. We had Sears and Roebuck catalog. Thankfully, they were pretty thick. And the index part was really good because uh, it was softer. And, uh, that's, and, and if you had an area where you were large enough to have a telephone book, a big one, we lived in Kansas and hardly any people said so no telephone books. You know, it's like... <laughs> What's this? Anyway, now we have Charmin and anyway, sorry. <laughs> so again here, nobody wants to hear the truth. People in the millennium, because of what they go through, that's why the war has to be as great as it is. To take away the false hope of mankind. You're not going to get it from your government. You're not going to get it from any weapons. You're not going to get it from anything. And just to destroy it all, you're not going to get it from the God you're praying to. He's not going to intervene to help you. It's going to happen. It's going to take place. And so after that, then people can begin to be worked with. What a horrible thing that the world has to go through this in order to begin to be worked with by God. The lofty looks of mankind shall be humbled. The haughtiness of mankind shall be bowed down. And when I read through things like this, I think of within the church, because this has to be fought within the church. We can't be lifted up with pride and think we're something and tend to look down on someone else or whatever it might be that we do because all pride looks down on other people. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> the haughtiness of mankind shall be bowed down. The eternal alone shall be exalted in that day. So that's why God's doing it because He's going to be exalted and esteemed. People are going to begin looking to Him in a manner they never have because they want help. They want deliverance. In a massive way. For the day of the eternal of hosts will be upon everyone, proud and lofty. Upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought down or brought low. Then we finally come to Isaiah 3, where we begin the first sermon that addressed verse 12. So it takes a bit of a loop here and comes back now to some of the things here concerning the need to remove the oppression from women and to even have them rule within the church. It's a focus from God. What an incredible thing. Been hidden all this time and now it's time and it's there and it's like, this is awesome, awesome beautiful, wonderful, exciting. For behold, verse 1, for behold, the Lord, the eternal of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem, spiritual Jerusalem, the church, and from Judah, that which is about 
false Judaism, if, if you will, false Christianity that's scattered in the nations of Israel. Now, the rest of the verse here, the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread, the whole supply of water, not even in the scripture. Just exit there, exit out. Some of this stuff is disgusting. Literally, it, it's, it's totally focused in a different way here. That which is to be taken away is, is what it's talking about here in that respect. Uh, but anyway, let's go on here. Also to be taken away. So these things, in other words, what people have is to be taken away, and that's all that it's about. The supply of store for support isn't going to be there. The supply of bread and the supply of water, what they have trusted in, in the sense that they could always have it and it's there, is gone. That's, that's what it's talking about. But the way it's stated before is it's not stated that way at all. Verse 3, or verse 2. The mighty, men, the mighty man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the elder, the captain of the 50, the honorable man, the counselor, and the skillful artisan, and the skillful order. Basically, it's saying there's none that can help you. There's none who can lead or have soundness of mind who can help you. And that's the period of time we're entering into, and it's becoming more obvious. I will give children to be their princes. Now, this is why some of the verses later on, they think this is what this is all about, so that's why they inserted something that wasn't even there in order to make what they thought this is all about become. Nuts. Anyway. It's, it's about, it's not just about, it's not about youth. It's a, it's a word, basically, that can be used in that regard, but here to imply immaturity. That's, that's, that's the thrust of what's being said here. Uh, unsoundness of thinking. It's just immature thinking. And I mentioned some of that yesterday. Crazy, wacky, immature, not thought out. It's, it's off the cuff, nuts. We're seeing more and more of that in the world. Anyway, I will give basically unsoundness of thinking, immaturity, those who have that, to be your princes, to be those who rule. And so that's happening in the world, yes, but it happened within the church. Those who surrounded the individual who committed the apostasy, who is responsible for it, all those individuals, immature, 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 unsound, 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 sick, 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 anyway. So it's not about babes at all, uh, not about children at all in that respect. And uh, it's really about it from a Hebrew word that we looked at concerning verse 12. That means to take away from when it says take away the oppression. But anyway, going on here. Uh, this mistranslated phrase is simply one word that means to be taken away. So verse 4, I will give the immature so that they, so that rule will be fully taken away. So absolute confusion, unsoundness of mind, and what was there is going to be destroyed. The people will be oppressed. That's what happens. Every one of mankind and everyone, another one that's bad here, mankind by mankind, mankind by those nearest them. That's what it's saying. Everyone's going to be oppressed. So there's this period of time that happened within the, church, within the church, and this began to happen, though not even knowing that's what was taking place. But it's happening in the world, and does the world know what's taking place? No. The immature will act arrogantly toward the elder. That's what it's saying here. It's not the child. The immature will act arrogantly toward the elder. In other words, toward the mature, toward those who are more of sound-minded in that respect. And we can see that in government. We can see that division taking place more and more in the world and various governments and ideas that people have. So we saw, see a lot of immaturity, a lot of unsoundness of mind in that regard. And then they make fun of that which is of a sound mind and mature that makes sense. But not to them because their minds are so screwed up. Anyway. And that which is dishonorable toward the honorable. 
So the verses that follow build upon what's been stated in these verses to this point, but the metaphors or the analogies uh, would again take too long to address, so I'm just going to read it as it is. Then we take, take it up to verse 12, that we've now come to a right translation. Uh, My people take away the oppression of women and have or give them rule. So very much then about the church, about what can only take place within the church. It can't happen in the world. But have to understand these other things were happening in the church that led up to the apostasy. That which was mature, that which was sound of a sound mind that frankly that God gave through Herbert Armstrong to the church. Looked down upon, spoken against, on and on it goes. Anyway. Take away the oppression of women and give or have them rule my people who are to be moving forward, heir, and are being swallowed in the path of their way. Then verse 13, the eternal stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. We are at a time of heightened judgment in the church more than any other time in the last 2,000 years. And a lot of that is because of what it must be when Christ returns. And of understanding here that it was also God's purpose in the first 2,000 years to allow certain things to continue on and to learn from, just as it was from the very beginning. As it was said, there are many antichrists. So when antichrist was spoken of, that there would be a time in the future that would mark a time, in essence, for the church that Christ is to return, that this individual would stand up. But he, they said, but there are many antichrists. And then some were even mentioned by Paul and so forth because it was about working against Christ and to understand this is something that was going to exist in God's church until that one came along who would do the things that were given to Paul in totally trying to take away everything of the church. And so, again here, God's purpose has been to allow things. And you know what? You can learn from that. We can learn from the various things. I have learned from the things that I have seen and wondered why this is happening, how this could be in God's church and why certain ones. And then you come to a point in time and realizing, well, no, because of that, just like certain ministers, they should never be allowed the ministry again. Some of them that were put out in, in, in worldwide in the very beginning, but we weren't there yet in the sense of understanding how important that was. And I, I'm reminded here of something that, that all that God has instituted, I should say, even within Israel, that there were those, if they weren't apart, didn't do things in the way they should, just like what we're going through in this particular series right now, as they're coming back to Jerusalem, that there were those who were going to have their lands confiscated and so forth. And the point being is it was going to lead up to them being ostracized and they could no longer be a part of Judah. They were to be gone. Kind of disfellowshipment. But that was interesting in one of the tours there in, in Ireland as they talked about certain peoples and things that were there and the different groups within the area there and the different names of people that kind of uh, tribes as we referred to. And that's the way time has been in times past. And one of the worst things as he brought out was if someone were to be, because they had done something wrong within the tribe or whatever, that they were ostracized. They could no longer be a part of any tribe. And so they were alone. And this is to be a thing in essence that would cause fear in people so that they wouldn't do the things that were wrong. And there's a principle there for carnal human beings that this is a healthy thing. And so it has been in God's church. You know, if things are being done wrong and done in the wrong way, then, you know, it'd be the last thing we'd want to happen in life, to be separated from fellowship, to be separated from God. That's the greater thing to understand. But sometimes it takes something that's kind of physical as well to get what is really spiritual. The eternal stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The eternal will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his rulers. For you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor? Asked the Lord eternal of hosts. So it's our history recent history of what we went through. Moreover, the eternal says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. So now 
we go through chapter 1, chapter 2, the way the world is going to be when Christ returns and God's government's established, and now even more specific about certain things that are to take place to restore or to, in essence, to make things right concerning the family with women, the church with women, and then it goes through and makes it clear here, again, reminding what took place. Moreover, the eternal says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, we always used to read this as being something physical. It's like, well, anyway. <laughs> and walk with outstretched necks and, necks and wanton eyes. What does that mean on a spiritual plane? Sometimes we read through something and all we can see is something physical and, and we try to piece it into what, what is this in the world then? No, it's about the church. The daughters of Zion, it's about the church. It's meaning the people of the church. It's an expression that's being used because that has to do with spiritual adultery and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes. That's what happens when people want something different than what's given to them. They want something that God says no to. And they want it, and if they do it, that's, that's what spiritual adultery is. And so God says, if individuals walk around and that's what they want and they're talking about different things and, and talking about what they don't like about God's apostle Herbert Armstrong and, and what he's been doing and, and what needs to be changed and he's getting old and he's repeating the same thing about the two, tru two trees and we need someone else in there. People are, whatever, <laughs> anyway, whatever the reasoning, say, they want something else. What they want, <laughs> want eyes. Walking and mincing as they go. In other words, this is very repulsive to God because of what they're doing. This is how he describes people that did these things within the church. Making a jingling with their feet. They, this wasn't happening physically. But it's always a little noise that follows them along. And as soon as they find someone else that has a little noise that kind of agrees with them, all of a sudden it's a big conversation and they're gone. Therefore, the Lord will strike with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. What happened in the apostasy? It's a horrifying thing. What happened to one third who just quit, gave up on everything, didn't even try? One third who went back to Protestantism? Phew, strike with a scab the crown of the head. What a horrible thing to see, how sick it really is, how ugly it really is to be able to see it on a spiritual plane. Almost unbelievable how such a thing could even happen on a physical plane. If someone's been in God's church for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, which happened, and then all of a sudden to go back to, well, where should we put the tree this year, honey? Over in that corner or, you know, I think... You lost your mind? What, what happened to you? Invasion of the body snatchers. And the eternal will uncover their hidden parts. God's going to make it clear what they did. And so we can look at it now and we can see that. They're not hidden any longer. God brought it all to the surface and said, look at this. Look at this filth, swill. And that day the Lord will take away. Then the following verses describe all that that they have adorned themselves with, and again, using physical things to, to show how heinous these things are. Verse 25, your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in the war. So we can think about what happens in the end time and the war, and uh, reality is there's not really many, if any, that are going to die by a sword. But anyway, we understand that's about war. Well, why we need to understand a little bit farther. It's about spiritual warfare because they're not fighting or they're fighting with the wrong things. <laughs> That's what happened. They're destroyed. That's what God says. They shall fall by the sword. And if we understand even more, the word of God, the very thing, that will destroy them. They're judged by it. They're condemned. They're off on their own. Their minds are going to get worse and worse, and their lives are going to get worse and worse, and some so far that they'll never be able to come back. That to me is a marvel to understand some of these things because there's been attitude in times past that certain things are owed to us. Certain things are owed to us as soon as we get in the millennium because we've misread scriptures. God's going to do this. God's gonna, no, God isn't. We're going to continue to live physical lives and, and people are going to bury the dead. As Johnny mentioned here in his sermon recently, for seven months, I think it was, 
that long, burying the dead, trying to find bodies, cleaning things up? The young men shall fall by the sword, and your mighty men in the war. Her gates shall lament and mourn. And she, being desolate, shall not sit, but remain on the ground. So, even in that in time, for those who are resurrected, I think of it, the scripture that says, and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Always kind of a mystery in times past. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's the grinding of teeth and the weeping because when individuals see what they have done, when they are able to see in the great white throne and they were a part of worldwide and a part of the Laodicean era and those who have the blessing and opportunity of being resurrected into a new world, into a new time, to be given opportunity in a second physical life and to have that hit you that if I had done, if I had done, if I had done, I wouldn't be here. Anyway. First resurrection. Gave up the crown. I need to go on here. Isaiah 4 and verse 2. You know, we focused quite a bit on what happened within the church and what will happen in the scattered nations of Israel. And it's all concerning what God is creating and what he's going to give as far as the world is concerned in that period of time and what he's creating as far as the greatest of all is Elohim. And to realize this is what this Feast of Tabernacles is about is what we're picturing and that it's going to become established and the kingdom of God being established. So some of the following verses, again, are, some of this is so tough because they're horribly mistranslated. Verse, verse 1 is so bad that it takes a lot of it within a sermon to even explain why some of this stuff is so far off base. So, verse 2. In that day, the branch. It's a word that means that which springs up or that which grows up. Of the eternal will be beautiful and glorious. Now, there are times that there is a specific individual being spoken of, and then there are times that another matter is being spoken of because it has to do with growth and something that's springing up. And I think of Zechariah, just read this to you. Uh, Zechariah 6, verse 12 says, Tell him, saying, Thus speaks the Eternal of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the name, the branch, he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Eternal. This is about... So anyway, this, this is about the branch of righteousness uh, that was to spring up out of David. So we understand the, the very basic scripture. But the branch here in Isaiah 4 verse 2 is a continuation of the growth that was to spring up or spring up out of the world that God is going to give as a result of what happens because of what comes together that this feast pictures. In that day, the branch that which springs up, that grows up of the eternal will be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the earth, excellent and beautiful. Some verses, you can have, parts of the verse you have to mark through because they're just not there. The fruit of the earth, excellent and beautiful to the escaped of Israel. Now a spiritual Israel in essence. And all these words here. And it shall come to pass that, that's not even in scriptures. So it's saying here, to the escaped of Israel left in Zion. Who is that? It's us. What an incredible thing to understand. And remaining in Jerusalem, that which was able to continue on and become established within even the ministry of the church, shall be called holy, everyone that's written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord will have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. This is what's important to God. 
he has a plan where he's going to begin giving this to the world after the kingdom of God is established. But the greatest thing above it all, especially now, is this body. It's the church of God. It's the body of Christ. This is where God is, is working to produce growth and that which will have the opportunity of becoming a part of Elohim, a part of his family. This is what he wants above all else. The other parts later on can be worked with, will be worked with in their time. But this is what is important. We have to understand how important we are to God. Sometimes because we don't grasp that, we don't comprehend the kind of love and the kind of favor and the kind of help and the kind of protection that's going to be there for us as we go through some of the worst kinds of times of all human history, which we don't know when it's going to be. I will just be candid with you. I am prepared up here that it could be right after the high day. <laughs> or it could be before that. But I believe God's going to let us have a full feast no matter what. But things could happen like that in this world. That's where we are. There's some nutty things going on out there. Nutty people, wacky. Minds are gone with, sound, with any kind of soundness or reason. And their pride is more important. It's kind of like some of the old kings we've read about in times past there. And they're going to do whatever it takes to get whatever they want. They will use whatever they have to get whatever they want. And at some point here, it's just going to call come undone. And everything's moving closer and closer to it. I, I think of that crazy pipeline that had an explosion by it. Sabotage. They know it was sabotage. Who did it? Who did it? Well, if I had my, the book up here, I, I think I know who did it. And to understand why certain attitudes are going to change at some point even more so, because they're going to, they're going to have it up to here that they see the source of their problems. They're going to be able to shift it. It's not their fault. <laughs> it's not their fault they shut down all the power plants. It's not the, their fault they got rid of all the coal. It's not their fault they shut down the nuclear plants. It's their fault. Anyway. Hatred. It's going to get stirred up to a point in time where people are going to do some horrifying things. Leaders are going to do some horrifying things. They're going to come together in a moment that they can't even come together in the smallest of things right now. They can't agree. So they talk about, well, we've got to have fewer that we can have that do agree so we can go ahead with this part of it. And then the rest of them can play their little games like Hungary and isn't that Hungary or whatever that voted out of some of this at one point there, whoever it was. It just takes one out of 27 and things don't go through. Is that right? Some of you who live here? Yeah? Okay. I'm, I'm reading some of the right things. Sometimes I worry. <laughs> anyway. The eternal creates the establishment of Mount Zion. That's what it says. Simple. All the rest of the stuff there, worthless filler. That is assembled like a cloud of smoke by day. What an incredible example that's being used here. And shining as a flame of fire by night. I think of when God took them out of Egypt and he gave these things that were of him. And now he's saying, this is of me. This is my creation. Look at it. Mount Zion. And what it's going to mean for the world. That which continues on as God's church is never destroyed. And it continues on, though it be small. But the truth is there and just has to be printed or spoken of and it'll start moving around the earth quickly. Because everybody's going to, have to be brought up to date. Even the apostles, as soon as they're resurrected, all these truths that begin to be revealed through Hubert Armstrong on. They're going to come to understand things they never knew. A cloud of smoke by day and shining as a flame of fire by night for a glory of covering all the rest is scratch it out. To the tabernacle, verse 6, to be shade in the daytime from the heat for a place of refuge, shelter, and as a place of protection from storm and rain. In other words, finally, this is what God's focusing upon to establish, to bring about the humility that needs to be here, to be able to receive this in the world and then to correct and straighten out the church and give greater truth within the church and cleanse the church and give opportunity for that cleansing to everyone who's a part of it. And this is what comes through it then. Small. 
It's going to be, it, it's a, it is a tiny little mustard seed compared to what's going to spring up quickly behind it on the earth as soon as Christ is here, as soon as 144,000 here, is here. So we live in some incredible times to understand what God's going to give this world. Finally, a peace that mankind has never known. Justice, can you imagine? Justice, judgments that are given by judges that aren't prejudiced, that don't have some political bias of some sort, that don't have some other agenda, you know, that has hurt so many people in the world and countries that are hurt by it sometimes, the things that take place, and to understand that everything comes down is going to be fair and righteous all the time. The people can live under that. The people can grow under that. Peace. No more wars. Not going to allow people to break out in war anywhere. God's not going to allow that. No more kind of crime like we see in cities. They're just going to be destroyed. We're not going to have long judicial systems and did, did you read him his rights? Well, I think he knew he shouldn't have pulled the trigger. <laughs> you know, <laughs> give him another time in another place. Put him to death. Simple. That's what God's method was. You take someone's life like that and murder someone, and psh, you're going to pay for it. How do you pay for it? Well, not 20, 30, 40, 100, whatever it is in years, in, in, in a prison or somewhere. We're not going to have huge prisons. Anyway, what an awesome thing to understand what's coming and what we have to be a part of.